for Mona Shelburne from the Mothership, a senior writer, NBA Today panelist, and uh, joining us on the program. Random question to start out. Would you rather have Clay Thompson's career or Scottie Pippen's career? Um, I think 100% Clay Thompson because that would mean that I spent my life in Oakland with Steph Curry, <laughs> right? It was a really fun guy to hang out with. And Clay, to me, is a he likes to go fishing in the San Francisco Bay. Uh, you know, he's Steph is like a really nice, gentler uh, <laughs> co-star, superstar. And like Michael Jordan's breathing fire at me every day. Like Michael Jordan's going to tear my head off if I miss that defensive rotation. Steph just might like might look at me bad, but, I, you know, much better workplace environment, I think. All right. Uh, based off last night, how much confidence do you have in Golden State or how much confidence do you have in the Lakers? Um, I picked Golden State in seven in this series, and I think I stick with it because the part it wasn't the home court advantage that gave me the confidence in them in the series. I thought it was the fact that they had been there so many times in this. Every, the playoffs are a chess match. Every game, every half, every possession is just adjustment, adjustment, adjustment. And I thought... They've just done this so many times. For uh, LeBron's done it a lot, but none of the other guys on the Lakers roster have really done this in a sustained way for more than really just Anthony Davis in in the playoffs in 2020. We're still trying to figure out Anthony Davis. Yeah. It feels like we're going to continue to still try to figure out yeah. Anthony Davis. Why why is he such an enigma? You know, um, somebody very influential in Laker land said this to me two or three years ago. Um, we don't really know what makes him tick, right? Like, like there's certain superstars um, who you understand who they are, right? Like, at his core, like, you kind of understood what Kobe was about. You, you understood what, what he wanted out of, out of his career and out of every game, um, I think you understand what LeBron's about. I mean, LeBron, you know, if, if Kobe wanted to be Michael, I think LeBron wanted to be Jay-Z, right? I mean, he's he's both a billionaire off the court and a mogul off the court, but a um, four-time champion wants to be five-time, six-time if he can on the court. Uh, you know, to me, he's, his closest comparison as a player is magic, right? He's, he's, he's 6'9 and can distribute the ball. I don't know. I don't know what makes Anthony Davis tick. Like, I don't know. Is he trying to be an all time great center? Does he, is he motivated by fear of like, I don't want to fall short. Is he motivated by, um, you know, I, I want to prove myself to LeBron or I want to shut Charles Barkley up with the street clothes stuff. Like, I don't know what it is that, that makes him in that fundamental sort of fire way tick. Um, but I, I wonder if that's like yeah, that, Pau Gasol. Yeah. Pa Pal didn't have that fiery temperament, right? But it, but it worked. Why did it work with Pal? And you had Kobe there, yeah, staring him down. But is is that what it takes? That you know, almost the fear of failure with Kobe there breathing down. Yeah, yeah. I mean, literally, Pal and Kobe. I mean, that was the black swan, white swan stuff. But I think two things about Pal Gasol. It's a great, it's a great comparison. Um, I thought Powell wanted to be excellent. Powell is a high achiever. He's like, uh, would have gone to medical school if he wasn't a, a basketball player. He is somebody who, when he, when he messes up, when he, when he um, doesn't bring his best in a game, he's disappointed in himself because he knows he can do better. Like he's a, he's a, he's your classic high achiever in school, high achiever in life. And when he disappoints himself, he disappoints. You don't need to even tell him, right? He already knows. Anthony Davis, I think he, a lot of times he gets down on himself when he when he is not playing up to his level. In 2020, I thought he was really motivated by LeBron. LeBron was sort of his um, his Kobe, if you will, right? Like he wanted to impress LeBron. He wanted to prove to LeBron, like I have the championship medal. I I see LeBron talk to Anthony Davis the way Kobe talked to Powell, but it's not LeBron's personality. Like he's never gonna black swan white swan him. Right. He's never going to he's never going to try to motivate him in that way. And so I, I really think that it has to come from within with Anthony. Um, the best person to talk to about Anthony usually is, is his dad. He, you know, he's a he's known him his whole life. He knows what motivates him. And uh, he always tells me about the championship game in Kentucky where Anthony didn't really have a great game. 
but he played lights out defense and he 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 had one of his best rebounding games much like you saw in that Memphis series or you and and I think for for Anthony the the key is really not to get down on himself is to focus on what you can do for the team rather than what you're not doing when things are bad like the, a lot of what people in Lakerland talk about is keeping him up keeping him from getting down on himself um and that's a different wiring for a superstar than you normally see well i i noticed when you engage him early then yeah and he's successful early then i know he's going to give me something at the other end as well and it's almost like you know later in kareem's career magic got him engaged early yeah so he didn't sort of drift a little bit and that's Game one, he was engaged. Game two, he never got it going. And there was a three-minute stretch last night. I didn't know he was on the floor. Yeah, I mean, there's. I saw some of those defensive highlights. Like I always, I like to read Anthony Slater's breakdown articles in the Athletic afterwards. And he, he had a couple of clips, and it was like AD on defense, and it was like he was just walking around. Like, and I was like, I've never seen AD walk around on defense. That's and that to me is, hey, I thought he was really fatigued after game one, and it was a it was a quick turnaround. Like he played so hard every single one of those 44 minutes in game four i'm sorry in game in game one and i don't i don't know if you can play with that level of force yeah two games in a row with that short of a turnaround and especially not when you're already down 20. like i almost felt like it was close for a little while they fell behind by too much and then they just kind of they're just kind of saving it for game three and four at home we're talking to ramona shelburne uh espn nba insider senior writer nba today panelist I don't know if it's recency bias, but this is a topic that's come up. If Steph would win a title, and yeah. now he's got five, where is Steph? And then people even said he would move past LeBron. I mean, those are the two dominant players of their era. Okay, and I'm and I'm not including Giannis yet in that era because I think he's younger. Okay, Steph's 35, LeBron's 38, so Giannis he's got a few, he's a little younger um, and a little more time to go, but. I don't know. It, Steph is a really interesting comparison for everyone. He's the closest comp to me, and this is going to sound weird, but it's it's really Tim Duncan. Um, he's this sort of unappreciated, like, I mean, you appreciate him. Of course, people appreciate him. They think that he's great, but he sort of gets tagged with this system player uh, the year when everyone was hurt. And then, you know, it was just kind of him all alone. They finished eighth. Remember that year, two years ago? Um, and there was this thought like, you, you know, he needs Clay and Draymond and a team around him. Whereas if you had Michael Jordan or, but or if you had just LeBron, they could carry a team. I, I think that narrative is false. Like I, I've seen LeBron when he doesn't have the right team around him. We, we saw that at the beginning of this year when he didn't have the right yeah. team around him. Right. And they were, they barely finished seventh. So to me, Steph to, will a hundred percent will be remembered as the greatest shooter of all time. That's, that's like out of the question at this point. Like he's already got that. Um, now I think when you get to five, now you're in a totally different group of players. Now you're up there with magic, you know, there's like, you're not quite to Jordan yet, but, but there's a, there's a Kobe's got five magic. Like this is a different echelon of all time greats. And, um, Steph, I don't think he gets enough credit because of the two he won with Durant. You know, Durant was clearly the finals MVP, but these, if he wins another one, another late career title, where he's the man, he's the superstar, just like that first title they won. I think that puts him in a in in that rarefied air. Whereas LeBron, to me, I think he goes down right next to Michael, one A, one B, as the as the greatest players of all time. Just because it's not just about the scoring or the titles or anything like that. It's just, I mean, it's just the eyeball test, right? I mean, like uh, you watch LeBron, and there's never been a six nine guy who plays with as much force as LeBron does with as much skill. Were the Bucks looking for a reason to fire Mike Budenholzer? Yeah, it's been out there for a while, right? I mean, that I feel like I've heard the fire bud stuff for two years, three years. And the year they finally won the title in 2021, like it almost felt like he had to win a title not to get fired. I mean, it just felt like in that direction. Then he won and then you go, okay, well, you can stay for a little bit. <laughs> um, but it was it was one slip up away and it it is kind of remarkable though i was thinking about this last night when i was watching the warriors so 20 2019 nick nurse wins the title now he's been fired 2020 frank vogel wins the title now he's been fired 2021 mike budenholzer wins the title now he's been fired who won in 22 steve Steve kerr Kerr. 
And he's the only guy who, like, when you talk about sustainability as a, as a team and as a coach, it, it's really hard to do that in this era, especially with giant personalities. Like, you have to have a superstar to win a title, okay? Um, I don't know. This, this, one, this one hurts because we all know what he's been through personally with his brother and everything the last, you know, the last month or so. Um, but it, it really comes down to your superstar. I mean, they're never going to fire a coach without running it by the star. I remember when when they got rid of Jason Kidd before this, you know, they they told Giannis and he tried to save him. You know, he really had a bond with Jason Kidd. Um, you know, uh, he, he flat out at the end of the last game, he said, I thought we could have made more adjustments, but that's on the coach. I mean, so I think this is about the relationship between Giannis and, and Mike Budenholzer. If it, if it was a great one, if it was something that he would go to the mat with, yeah. um, Mike would still be there. Ramona, great to talk to you. Have a great weekend. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Dan. Ramona Shelburne, NBA insider for the Mothership Senior Writer, and uh, she'll be there for Game 3 with the Lakers and the Golden State Warriors, also a uh, panelist for NBA Today.